My name is Maureen McCarthy, and I'm on the board of City Club. Our president of City Club is at a conference and unable to be here today, so I get the really fun task of uh, just welcoming you back into the room. It's great to see your faces and hear your voices. Really, really wonderful. Uh, we want to begin today by acknowledging with humility that the land where we are is the territory of the people of the Salish Sea. Their presence is imbued in the waterways, shorelines, valleys, and mountains of the traditional homelands of the Coast Salish people. And it has been this way since time immemorial. Um, at this point, I want to introduce Kathy Herbold, if she's nearby, to say a, a hello and welcome from the Yacht Club. Well, thank you. Um, we are delighted to have you here at the Yacht Club in the marina room. I don't know how many people have been in this space before. I'm kind of curious. Raise your hand if you have. Excellent. Keep up the good work, please. Lots of things going on here. We love having all of you here, seeing some of the faces in the room. I haven't seen in years, guys. But welcome to the Bellingham Yacht Club. Okay, let's see. Uh, the next thing I want to do is take a moment to acknowledge Jane Freudenberger, who for many, many years was our program chair at City Club. And I think Jane would say it's a labor of love. And those of us who have worked with her on the program committee know that's really a lot of labor. Um, and also just a lot of intelligence and humor and tact and forbearance and, uh, and uh, sometimes even, you know, sometimes it's a nail biter type of a job too. For example, if you have a speaker and they disappear and you have to find another one. So um, if you've enjoyed city club programs over the years, it is in large part to the leadership Jane has provided on the program committee. So big hand for Jane. And then I should also say a enormous thank you to Jane Bright, who is brave enough to step into Jane Freudenberger's shoes. Jane, if you wouldn't mind waving your hand. Um, and actually, Jane, I should have had you do the same. Jane Freudenberger, who is our outgoing program chair. Okay. Uh, a quick but important thank you to our sponsors. We have Bruce and Claudia Dyson, uh, Danny Neal, real estate, real estate broker of the Moliot Group, Firehouse and Events Center, Colshan CPAs, Opportunity Council, Pacific Continental Realty, Unity Care Northwest, Village Books, Western Washington University, Whatcom Community College, and the Whatcom Community Foundation. Uh, now, I would like to introduce today's moderator, who is a longtime City Club program member, also a former mayor of Bellingham, and also an all around brilliant human. Tim Douglas. Now there's a high standard, brilliant human, huh? Oh my God, how do we read that? Well, welcome everybody. Uh, it is so exciting to be back together, um, as I know you all feel as well. And uh, I was thinking uh, before we got started today, how tough it must be to be living right now on Guam. You know, if you've followed that, they're getting hit with this incredible typhoon, one of many they've been struck with before, but this one doesn't quite yet get up to the 175 mile an hour winds that last devastated them, but uh, is like, I think, hitting 150 plus gusts or something like that. The point being that we are every day hearing a news story about yet some other place that has either suffered from landslides, suffered from hurricanes, is flooded out, as we were in this county not that long ago for a while. Uh, just the reality that no matter how much in the past people debated about whether or not climate change was real, we all know that it is. We don't even have to be scientists to be aware of that, but it helps paying some scientific attention to it. So today we want to look at not the broad scale question of climate change, but instead what we are and can be doing locally to help build a resilience uh, against and to, to combat climate change. And we have today three very well qualified uh, panelists who I would like to introduce to you now. And then we are going to move 
to each of them individually to come and, and talk to you a little bit about things. First of, first of all, Seth Vidanya, uh, to my right here, yeah, to our right. Uh, Seth is the uh, first ever City of Bellingham Climate and Energy Manager. Uh, think about that, Climate and Energy Manager. I'm gonna be fascinated to hear about how one manages those things. But Seth, Seth uh, comes with a, a really great background. He's, he's uh, earned his master's degree at what was formerly the Huxley College of Envir Environmental uh, Studies at Western, but now is the College of Environmental Studies. Uh, he set up there a uh, Department of, of Sustainability and became Director of Sustainability for Western while he was there, and then Seeing his talents and knowledge, Bellingham seized him and appointed him to this new position, first ever position. Uh, and he has an excellent overall perspective of the climate action plan which the city has adopted and which we are all in the process of implementing at the present time. And uh, one, th one thing that I think will be very useful to us is having Seth, highlight at least some of the key elements of that in terms of what we are trying to accomplish uh, in combating climate change uh, as a city and broader community. Uh, Nicole Oliver, sitting next to him, is, has been the director of the Parks and Recreation Department since 2020. Uh, she previously was managing a lot of the facilities development there and stuff. She has just, her list of what she has done at the city for the past 20 plus years is endless. Uh, one notable part of it was that she was the, uh, the communications or uh, um, legislative coordinator for the city council for some time, but she's also done permit work and um, a lot of analysts and analytics of the various things that different departments are doing, and she just has a great background, but really particularly is gonna help us take a look at what the Parks and Recreation Department in particular is doing in terms of moving us more towards that which we can do environmentally um, with the natural habitat that we are so fortunate to have here and what we can do to enhance that to combat co uh, climate change. And then to Nicole's right, is Michael Fuhrer, who I will say I am very pleased to serve with on, on his board, of the nonprofit organization Whatcom Million Trees Project that he established uh, over two years ago. Uh, he has hundreds of volunteers who have stepped forward to help us do things that actually enhance uh, the presence and protection and even the planting of new trees, I mean million, you hear that, but uh, we aren't getting to a million right away, but we are really working at it. And Michael has really worked on, on projects of all kinds to, uh, not unrelated to that even, to help uh, the public good. And he has a very strong ethic in that regard. And uh, his efforts so far has been warmly embraced by the community and we'll be able to hear more about that because he's gonna wrap up the three presentations, telling us more about specifically what kinds of things, what, what trees do, the importance of trees, uh, the tree canopy, and many other important things, and then also projects that the Walk a Million Trees project has underway that even people like I have been involved in. I have helped rip up blackberry roots uh, around on the edge of parks, and we planted hundreds of trees and, and prepared for the future planting of further trees, et cetera. And it's, it's just been a delight because every work party is full of people from youngsters all the way up to elsters like me who are rolling up their sleeves and doing very practical things to help us enhance our parks through the tree canopies that they can provide. So that is our group. And what I'd like to do then in terms of our, how we can combat climate change one tree at a time, 
Uh, I'd like to introduce Seth and ask him to come forward and make his presentation. Seth. Thanks for that introduction. Yeah, round of applause. Mayor Douglas, thank you. And to answer your question, Mayor Douglas, uh, managing the climate does flow from my fingertips. So if, you, if it's too warm or too cold, I have located the thermostat. And uh, just let me know. OK, thanks for the introduction. My name is Seth Bidanya. I'm the climate and energy manager for the city of Bellingham. And I'm here to talk with you today about the work being done at the city and what you all can do in your businesses, your homes, to help us with this, this work, this great work of reducing your impact on the climate and getting to uh, a stable climate. I work out of the Office of Climate that Mayor Fleetwood set up to combat, uh, in his words, what is an existential crisis. I work there with my colleague, Claire Fogelsong, and uh, we work for you, the, the public, on this, on this important matter. Now, we'll spend a, a lot of time talking about uh, CO2, carbon dioxide, and it's important to kind of get a grip on, on what, we're, what we're talking about. So CO2, we talk about it in the, in the climate world, it's kind of challenging to, to wrap your mind around what it is, and it makes sense. CO2 is an odorless, and uh, invisible gas. We don't really see it pile up in the environment like we would something like, like garbage, right? It's hard to see it. This group here, EcoMotion, has put together a model. This is a 30-foot diameter sphere of CO2 to show you what one ton of CO2 looks like. And when we're talking about uh, carbon dioxide, often we're referring to it in the hundred of thousands of tons or millions of tons, or in the case of the globe, billions of tons of, of uh, carbon dioxide. And it is challenging to uh, imagine the volume that we're putting out into the uh, atmosphere. But I want to show you just a, a quick video from a, a group called Carbon Visuals. They're showing the amount of CO2 that's emitted in New York City. This is one hour's emissions. In New York City, remember these are all sphere, 30 foot spheres of carbon dioxide, these, these, these models of blue spheres. And they'll move into a, one day's emissions. And in just one day, we have carbon, enough carbon to eclipse some of the tallest buildings in New York City. And then look at what happens over the course of a year. It really is astounding just how much of this invisible gas we are putting into the atmosphere that is changing the composition of the atmosphere, warming it, and changing weather. Uh, uh, Mayor Douglas talked about what's happening in Guam right now. So that's just a, just a, a visual to help us understand where, uh, where, where we're at. And right now, we put about 35 billion tons, so 35 billion of those spheres, those 30-foot spheres of gas into the atmosphere uh, every year. And this is going into a very small space in the atmosphere. If you take the entire Earth and shrink it down to the size of an apple, the volume of the atmosphere is as thin as that skin on the apple. So we're putting all of that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, changing, changing the climate. Here at the city of Bellingham, we recognize this. Mayor's seen fit to create an office of, of climate. And we actually have been monitoring emissions back to 2000 and have goals for reducing that. We're looking at a 40% drop by 2030, an 85% drop by 2050. And we may be actually adopting even more advanced targets over time that science tells us we need to, to avoid the worst consequences of, of climate change. So it's a lot of work to do and a short amount of time, what do you do? I am bombarded every day with offers from businesses, organizations, uh, non-governmental entities that would like us to uh, follow suit with the project that they want us to uh, adopt to reduce these emissions. And there's, there are literally uh, hundreds of, of different opportunities that we could take on. And I think it's important to uh, really simplify this world down into something that we can wrap our heads around. And I have a little memory device we're going to call this the carbon five. And the memory, the mnemonic device is the B. And so these folks here have these six tables up front. You're going to be the. So I'm going to point at you, and you're going to say the. That's pretty good. Let's try it again. One more time. The, OK. Uh, B in the back. OK, let's see if you can outdo them. One, two, three. B. Oh, the. You got some competition here. You will be competing with one another. 
at the end, just want to let you know what we'll have a quiz. So pay attention. So this is the T in the B. What's the first thing we need to do? Shift transportation mode and electrify those transportation op options that have motor motors. You'll see from the chart here that combustion of liquid fuels, that's gas and diesel, uh, that's 43% of the emissions from the city of Bellingham, from the community of Bellingham. So what, what are we doing here at the city? What is our response? One, we're increasing density in multifamily zones. That allows people to work and live in the same area and have access to bus lines, uh, bike lanes so that they can use low carbon transportation. We're continuing to build out, build out our pedestrian infrastructure. We have now 172 miles of sidewalk and almost 100 miles of bike lanes. I know Eric might correct me on that, um, but that's about, that's about right. Uh, we're creating electric vehicle charging for those times where you do need to use a car. We're promoting EVs here in town. Uh, we have 50 electric vehicle chargers in Whatcom County. We'll be doubling that by the end of the year with the project to put more chargers here in Bellingham. And we continue to purchase electric vehicles for the city fleet. Now a quarter of our light duty fleet at the, at the city of Bellingham is hybrid, plug-in hybrid, or as battery electric. So what can you do in this area? The answer is pretty simple. Get out of the car. That is, that's really it. Walk, bus, and bike. Uh, if you want to find an easier way to get around, e-bikes are a great way. How many people here own an e-bike or have used an e-bikes? A 150% jump between 2019 and 2020 in the sale of e-bikes. I see them everywhere here in town. E-bikes are a great way to go. And a lot of us do need an electric vehicle to get, or a vehicle to get around. We're promote, promoting electric vehicles for a few different reasons. One is the carbon emissions over the lifetime of that car, about half with what they would be of an internal combustion engine. And the fuel is half as well feels half the cost of an internal combustion vehicle. And we really like that for folks in the low and moderate income category, help them to save on fuel costs. The challenge is, is getting those folks into, the, into cars, which are now running about $10,000 over what an internal combustion vehicle is. Hopefully that'll, that'll come down over time. And there's lower maintenance costs in these vehicles as well, about half EVs are half the maintenance costs of an internal combustion vehicle. Number two, this is the H of the V. Heating, electrify space and water heating and use less energy inside. You'll see from the graph that about 20% of the carbon emissions here in the city come from the combustion of natural gas for space and water heating. And what are we doing as a city, city, uh, city government? One, we're building all electric buildings. The new operations center at Pacific Street is built all electric, no natural gas to heat that, that building. In the community, we've created an electrification requirement for new commercial and multifamily buildings for the most part. Those will be built using fuel, using electricity as the fuel to heat them. And this year, we'll be walking out an electrification pilot program to help our moderate and low-income folks to electrify their homes and make benefit of uh, electrification in the spaces they live. What can you do as a community? I'd say one of the, the best things is to call the community energy challenge. They can provide you with an analysis of your home, what you can do to weatherize, insulate, air seal your homes, uh, and to potentially get air, uh, air pumps into, or heat pumps into your home. On average, they, they, save, they save the average house $450 a year in energy savings through the Community Energy Challenge. Help you weatherize your home. And the Opportunity Council, who's one of the partners in the uh, Community Energy Challenge, has a ton of opportunities for folks in the low-income category to help weatherize your home for very cheap or free. Number three on the list here, this is the first E in the, is uh, switching to low carbon electricity. Electricity use the city of Bellingham is a, is a third of the total carbon that we emit here or responsible for a third of the total carbon we emit in the community. What are we doing at the city? We've contracted with our utility, Puget Sound Energy, to have them supply us with enough electricity derived from uh, wind and solar to power all of our city buildings. They're all powered by green energy. And we're also tracking legislation at the state level to make sure that our utilities are following suit with the Clean Energy Transformation Act, which will help all utilities reach a zero carbon level by, by 2045. Things that you can do, you can source renewable energy through PSC, another organization. You can have people generate wind or solar power for your home. There's a, a small fee for that. 
If you are of the means, you can install solar panels on your home and have the utility pay you for the power that you produce through a net metering law. There's also community solar opportunities. If you're a renter or someone that doesn't have the roof uh, for solar, solar panels, you can engage in and enroll in a solar uh, community solar program. And PSC has one right now with uh, some shares for, for folks in low-income category. The, the fourth letter in our uh, memory device is E for engage others. What can, uh, what can we do as a city? We recognize this, uh, mayors recognize this for a long time, that we can't do this work alone. Uh, it really does take coordinated efforts. And so we're reaching out to uh, our, our friends at uh, Whatcom County, at the Port of Bellingham. We have a joint climate action team that we work with them on. We're lobbying the state legislature every year for items to help you all I, uh, live a low carbon lifestyle. This last year, the state legislator appropriated $80 million for heat pump incentives. That'll be going to you. We at the city lobby for things like this. And we have a climate week every year to connect you with all of the organizations that are doing this work in town. It's not just the city. We have a ton of non-governmental organizations, community groups, et cetera, that are, that are doing this work. In terms of what you can do, you can start a carbon team at work, at, uh, in your neighborhood, social group. Plenty of folks here have, have done this, and we are here at the Climate Office to support that work. You can connect with your electeds at local, state, and federal levels. Writing emails, phone calls does actually matter, and I've seen that from city government. One email, a couple of emails going a long way in changing um, what we do here at the city. And then you can join and support our local organizations that are doing this work. Now, the E here in the, wait, what do you all up here? I'm going to point at you. The back, B, nice, nice. I added this on here, B, for buying. When we look at the average American carbon footprint, 26% of it comes from the products that we purchase, and another 14% from food alone, just the things that, that we buy uh, to eat. Here's some examples here. This is a chart of the carbon impact of, of food. You look in the, the sort of rice and legumes area, fractions of a pound, uh, beef somewhere above uh, six. Now, this is not the city of Bellingham telling you that you need to now eat tofu burgers for the rest of your life. But I will say, if you do, you may impress your grandchildren. I just want to say that. You may impress your grandchildren. But even the, the difference between, say, a chicken burger and a beef burger, five times, five times less carbon when you go with the chicken versus, versus the beef here. Let's look at products, smartphones. We think about all the power that goes into smartphones. Our phones, most of the carbon is produced during manufacturing. 80 to 95% of that 120 pounds of carbon is produced when that phone is manufactured. So what do you do? One, ask yourself, do you need the iPhone, what are we at, 200 million now? Is that the number? Uh, by used, I have a used phone myself. You can take care of your product uh, by a case, and recycle your old phone, so that carbon that's inherent in uh, building a phone gets to go back into the, uh, in the industrial cycle. So here we go, carbon five quiz time. I'd like you to raise your hand and tell me what letter, what's, what, uh, what does the letter you see stand for in what we talked about, and one thing you can do or the city is doing, and you are competing, V versus B. Here we go. Okay, the first letter is T. T, hand, hands high. Let me see, yes. Yes, please. Okay, one thing. Or that the city is doing one thing you can do. Okay, nice. Oh, we're cities buying electric and hybrid vehicles. One point for the, it's, it's, quick, it's a quick game, folks. It's a quick game. Okay, H. Okay, H, in the back. Heating, and one thing you're doing or we can do. Heat pumps, nice. Okay, that's one to one. Oops, oh, shoot. Okay, rewind the tape. Third thing. What was the third thing? What's, raise hands. Do you have a hand? What is it? Yes, and one thing. Solar, perfect, I love it. Okay, two to one, what's the fourth E? We're getting down to it, we're getting down to it. Hand raised, engage, and what, what's something we can do? I'm trying to talk to all my friends in the Bronx for mayor to see what's going on. Oh, well, okay. Spicy, spicy, okay, engagement. 
All right, last, what is that? I think that's three to one, but we can still do this. Let's see, in the back, yes. Okay, what's one thing? Buy, buy fruits and veggies, stay away from beef. Excellent, okay. Now, uh, the you did win, and I wanna say we worked, we've been working with the Yacht Club for a long time. We do have a prize for the whole lot. Uh, it's a boat. Um, the challenge is that it is at the bottom of the marina. It is yours, though. Just want to let you know. So talk to me later. So we, uh, sign up for more info. We'd love to send you our newsletter. Stay in contact with you. I'll have some sign-up sheets up here. And the website is cob.org slash climate. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for making space. Appreciate it. Oh, our stand-up comic here is our first speaker. This is really something. Uh, Seth, could you just elaborate a little bit more on so community solar? Um, we know that this is going around some parts of the country, and can you describe a little bit more what that really is and how, how it might come to pass here? Yeah, it's, it's pretty simple. It's set up for folks that rent or folks that don't have the, the right roof or you have a lot of uh, trees around your roof and you want solar panels. And Community Solar, you actually do own a, a share of, it's almost like a, 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 a solar panel co-op. You do own a share of panels. You may own six or 12 or 24 panels, however many you buy into. And from that, you get the benefit. You get the, the power that goes into the grid. And in some cases, you get the tax credit as well from that community. Community. So it depends on, on, on the organization. But again, PSC does have a community solar program. They have community solar in, in five different places. And there are other organizations. You don't have to just go with PSC. So it's essentially uh, solar for folks that can't put it on their, on their homes or the, where, they, where they live. Is that, is that enough? great? The question was, is solar going on to uh, any of the, the city buildings? Well, that's a great conversation. Eric's giving thumbs up. And my conversations with Public Works is now we really do look at when we're replacing a roof, uh, that putting solar on that and making those roofs solar ready as well. So that's standard operating procedure for city buildings is that consideration. How are we, how are we orienting that roof? Can we put solar on that? And it seems like um, uh, that's, what, that's what we're doing. Uh, so yes, when we do our greenhouse gas inventories, you saw the data there, we do calculate uh, the methane produced, so by power, a power that's, that, that uh, PSC and, and Cascade Natural Gas uh, 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 uses or that we use, we do count the methane in there. What's not included in our greenhouse gas inventory, and it's almost no greenhouse gas inventories include this, is things like the methane from the food that we, that we consume, these consumption-based inventories, very early on in the process there. there and, and my guess is over time, what we'll see is that carbon pie actually grow as we start to count those things. But we don't currently do that right now. And I don't know of any city other than maybe one on the East Coast that's doing that right now. But yeah, we consider methane, uh, refrigerants, all those, all those things, as well as we can, we can measure them right now. Yep. And I think we'll do Q&A. Yeah, we're going to do Q&A after two, but I did want to get a couple of questions in here, as, as obviously you did too. So, Seth, thanks again. And now we're going to move to Nicole Oliver, Parks and Recreation Director, who has really been working on their part of achieving our objectives for combating Wonderful. climate change. Thank you, Tim. I'm gonna focus in on stewardship and climate resiliency planning that we're doing in parks. In addition to an incredible park system that has been acquired over the years in large part due to us as a community taxing ourselves since 1990 with greenways and acquiring riparian corridors and trail corridors and open space and developing a park system, I'm gonna go deeper into something much more specific. So what I'm gonna be talking about is our expanded stewardship program. Uh, funded by Greenways, we expanded and created an, um, an umbrella for all things that were about public engagement. Uh, the volunteer program, our community garden program, our wetland mitigation, and our park ambassadors. 
And then I'm going to speak a little bit about our climate resiliency capital planning and uh, projects. And then I'm going to give you a video about the first two phases of the urban forestry management plan, a really important interdepartmental project that we're working on. So the volunteer program is how many of you have volunteered on a Saturday or make a difference day, Arbor Day, Martin Luther King Day, there's a few people. So uh, this is a program that empowers, empowers the community and it helps teach skills to help care for the parks and open space. In the last 10 years, we have, with the volunteer program, um, we've had 250,000 volunteer hours in our parks. And a lot of this work is about resiliency. It's about helping our forests and our trail corridors um, remove invasive species, ivy, blackberries, and then plant and restore these areas. This work is, and then plant trees, 75,000 native trees and shrubs have been planted. So we've by putting this, creating this umbrella stewardship program, we're able to expand our volunteer program and really focus that energy on the community outreach. So there's those uh, big events. We have big events. We're talking 250 people or more show up for these events. We also have park stewards all over the community that um, maintain a dogway station near their home or take care of a little piece of trail. Um, we also have bark stewards that help us with the dog waste, reminding people of just how important it is to uh, clean up after your pet. And then we have uh, volunteers and interns and AmeriCorps folks working in the Bellingham School District and providing environmental education um, in the classroom. These are all of our partners just for the volunteer program. They bring coffee, pizza. They help us with staffing, organization, um, Nooksack Salmon Enhancement, Association is a long-term partner that especially focuses on salmon recovery projects. And we are so thankful for all of our, our, our partners. And you know, before the volunteer program and, and stewardship community gardens, they all had to compete for the staff's attention with all the other things that the staff have to do as far as maintaining and running a park system. Now that it's under this umbrella, um, it has a little more focused attention. Wetland mitigation, whenever we build a park, this is Cordata Park, we impact a wetland because a lot of that property was wetlands. So we have to plant it, enhance it, maintain it, take care of it. And uh, the volunteer program and stewardship is taking on that work. And the park ambassadors, these are our staff that are out in the parks. They're full-time in the summers and part-time in the rest of the year. And they provide information to the public. They remind people about what the rules are. We have a lot of people that forget what the rules are. <laughs> uh, they also help with facility reservations. We rent out um, a lot of our facilities, help with litter, graffiti, and again, the dog waste stations. And then our community gardens program, um, the emphasis has been to expand this, this program. And so we have three right now, uh, Fairhaven, Sven Hoyt, which is over in Happy Valley, and the Lakeway Community Garden, right there by the Garden View Tiny Homes. Um, there are 195 plots that people can rent for a year, and uh, we do have a waiting list, but it's not that deep. And uh, you can rent it for $40. Um, we have returning gardeners, and um, we also have scholarships available. But the good news is we are opening a new community garden that's under construction right now in the King Mountain neighborhood in the Van Wyck Park space up off of Meridian and, and Van Wyck Road. There's going to be 50 new gardening plots available. And we've got a very dedicated and excited neighborhood that's helping with that project. And it's also funded by Greenways. We also rent out a space on Ellis Street right by the food bank to the Washington State Extension Office. And they work with North, um, uh -oh, they work with youth in the community to do public vocational and education of youth with options high school students, Northwest Youth Services, and Grow Food. That's a, a spot that they rent for almost nothing um, in exchange for the work they're doing. And then we have the Chuckanut Center over in Fairhaven that does homesteading, uh, preservation classes. They also garden. They raise a ton of food for the food bank as well. So projects, projects, projects. Everything we do in parks, we're looking at it from a climate lens now. We actually have to defend any, any additional funding. We have to explain how it's gonna help the climate. That's across the board at the city. Sportsplex, it's our big ice rink. We're doing a new roof and an HVAC system. 
That means we're going to have a very big, well-insulated, electrified building that in case we need it will be air-conditioned in case we have a big smoke uh, emergency this, this summer. We're doing electrification of systems. Every time we do upgrades in buildings, it's going electric whenever we can. Because um, solar is expensive, it makes the project a lot more expensive, so we are, we are seeking additional grants to help be able to do solar. We weren't able to afford it on the Sportsplex, but we hope to add it later once we get some more grants for that work. We're upgrading all the lighting, have a big project in Padden right now. The shoreline improvements, the erosion at the beach at, at Boulevard Park, I don't know if you've noticed, between uh, the Paddle Point and Woods Coffee, it's really eroding right there, so that's a big beach raising project. Um, and then our, we have a cleanup going on at the north end of Boulevard Park to raise that whole area, cap it. It's a, it's a major cleanup site. That project is underway. And once it's done, it will be resilient to uh, future sea level rise. We're building everything on the waterfront, um, accounting for that anticipated sea level rise. And then the other things are just trail etiquette. We, we, uh, we allowed e-bikes on trails now. That, that code was changed. And in conjunction with that, we are now installing speed limit signs, 15 miles an hour, <laughs> um, and hoping that people will <laughs> err on this, the lower side of that. Um, and then other planning, also just thinking about dual purposes for buildings. Um, when we upgrade the Bloedel multipurpose room, that could be a place of respite for people, again, with, eight, with uh, air conditioning and heat in case we need it in the future for the community. We're also changing our whole plant palette to be more drought tolerant uh, for landscaping in all the parks, creating more shade trees. We're going to be adding some we don't have a lot of big trees at Cordata Park. We get so many complaints about the lack of shade, but we're going to put in some umbrellas for the summer. And then we're looking at uh, Lake Padden, the nutrient loads. We've got a lot of increased algae on that lake, we're trying to make sure that we're using best management practices for that. Reducing our irrigation usage at Lake Padden Golf Course. We're going to be charging a $4 per round fee starting in the middle of uh, June, I believe, to help raise money for water irrigation. And then urban forestry, which is a big, important interdepartmental uh, project. And this is a video that will give you a little more information. Trees and forests make the city of Bellingham a special place. Our community has a long history of valuing our urban forest and is a proud Tree City USA community. An urban forest is made up of the trees and forests within a city on both public and private land. It includes your favorite forested park, the tree in your backyard, and trees along the street downtown. Come on a journey to learn more about the urban forest you live, work, and play in. Trees provide many important ingredients for a healthy community. With more than 80% of Americans living in cities and urban areas, there is a big need for trees. Trees clean our air and water. Trees reduce runoff, provide homes for animals, and connect people with nature. Bellingham's forests are also very important culturally as a place of rest, beauty, gathering, and food. Research shows that trees in cities improve people's physical and mental health and well-being. One study even found that walking in the forest boosts the cells in our immune system that fight viruses and cancer. Urban forests also help cities address climate change. On hot summer days, trees cool our streets and buildings and lower energy costs. Trees help improve air quality and store rainwater. Some of the benefits of Bellingham's trees were calculated using a program called iTree Canopy. Bellingham's urban forest provides approximately $42 million in stored carbon benefits with a yearly increase of $6 million in air pollution removed, runoff avoided, and carbon sequestered. Our tree canopy is made up of forests and trees found along streets, within parks, in open spaces, on school campuses, and on private land. Bellingham has a tree canopy cover of 40%, which is good news for the city. Just over half of the tree canopy is on private land. Bellingham also has large forested areas and corridors that are important for wildlife. The tallest tree in Bellingham is a Douglas fir tree, measuring 251 feet tall. That's taller than Bellingham Towers, which is the tallest building in the city. Bellingham's urban forest does have room for improvement. Most forests in Bellingham are younger and with help could grow into complex mature forests that could provide greater benefits. We could also improve the connections between forests to help wildlife move between habitats. We can improve access to forest benefits. Tree canopy cover is not the same across all of Bellingham's neighborhoods. 
Neighborhoods in the outer edges tend to have more canopy cover, while neighborhoods downtown tend to have less. Not everyone in Bellingham has access to the benefits they need from trees. When it gets hot, this can be a big problem for people, especially if they are older or have health conditions. Places with lots of hard surfaces and few trees are hotter than areas with many trees and fewer hard surfaces. Research has found that on very hot days, having tree canopy and less pavement can cool the air and protect people from illness and death from heat. We want to make Bellingham's forest benefits more equitable. We use the American Forest's Tree Equity Score to explore the equity of the urban forest across neighborhoods. The score is based on income, employment, race, age, climate, health, and the gaps in tree canopy. The score shows neighborhoods in Bellingham's central core are in the greatest need of more tree canopy. From 2006 to 2018, Bellingham's tree canopy remained at about 40%. Although the total stayed the same, canopy increased in some areas and in others was lost. Changes happen for many reasons, like when forests are cleared for timber, trees are removed for new buildings, or when they conflict with pipes or pavement. Fire, insects, and diseases can also cause loss. Tree canopy size can increase when forests grow back over time, when new trees are planted, and as planted trees grow. As our city grows and experiences the effects of climate change, we want to make sure we have a plan for maintaining a healthy urban forest. There are many stewards who care for the urban forest, including community members, nonprofit organizations, the city, government agencies, tribal governments, industry, and institutions. Together, we share responsibility for making sure the urban forest will survive and thrive to benefit future generations. We can work together with the help of an urban forestry management plan. An urban forestry management plan is a larger plan that helps all stewards maintain a healthy and desirable urban forest. The plan establishes a long-term vision for our urban forest while planning for the impacts of climate change and urban growth. The plan sets targets and priority actions to achieve our long-term vision. To learn more about Bellingham's urban forest, visit www.cob dot org slash UFMP. It was a little Dora the Explorer, don't you think? <laughs> that is the work of our, it kind of encompasses the first phase of the work on the urban forestry plan. We are going to be coming to the city council um, to um, give them a status update in July and ask for that specific targeted policy direction, those target goals. That's going to be happening in July, so stay tuned for that. And now, <laughs> this is a picture of one of our great volunteers in his favorite occupation of removing ivy. <laughs> Thanks, Nicole. Uh, Michael's going to be setting up his computer here for just, uh, I have a couple of questions for you, if I may, please. Um, in terms of the uh, urban canopy, the tree canopy, what can you say anything more specifically about the neighborhoods other than the central business district area, about where, where tree canopy is less abundant? Uh, yes, in the areas that have um, the densest population and where um, some of the uh, right-of-ways are narrower, I think um, around Roosevelt and uh, York, um, some of those denser, older neighborhoods are where sometimes we do not have as much tree canopy. Where we see a lot more tree canopy is some of the newer neighborhoods because we've done such a good job of planting and making room for street trees with the rules that required those. And also, can you uh, can you speak a little bit to who really is in charge of maintaining street trees when when they do get planted uh, immediately and in the long term? It depends on where the tree is. If it's on an arterial, it's most likely the park department. Some are uh, maintained by Public Works. If it's not on an arterial, it's the responsibility of the adjacent property owner. Okay, raise your hand if you're an adjacent property owner. <laughs> this this is a real challenge, and and I think you know just from my years as mayoring and since, and I, I want to credit Ken Hertz, 
former mayor with really having established the standard for having street trees. Every project that he was involved with, he made sure, including the, the redevelopment of the downtown core years ago, made sure that street trees were included. And I'll tell you, when you drive around Bellingham now, if you could turn the clock, clock back to when Joanne and I arrived, for example, in the late 60s, huh, there were street trees in a few older neighborhoods. And I'll tell you, other than that, everything was just paved over. There was no green. So Ken Hertz really should and can take a, uh, credit for what we, we see now, because it really has transformed Bellingham so much. But it gives people like Nicole all sorts of challenges and public works to figure out how to preserve these trees. You know, once they get put in place, we do have to pay attention to them. So uh, anyway, Nicole, thanks for the work you're doing. I appreciate your comments. OK, now we're going to turn to his eminence. Uh, Michael Fuhrer from the Walk a Million Trees Project. Michael knows so much about trees. Boy, I'm learning all the time from him and has been doing so much hands-on. And I think we'll be able to help talk about the role trees play and how we achieve resilience of trees as the climate does change, what kinds of trees should we be having, et cetera. And then also all the many, many community projects that go on in cooperation with parks and others, and, and what we can do individually if we want to volunteer for some of those. So, Michael. Thank you so much, Tim. Gosh, that was such a good intro. I don't think I need to say anything. <laughs> but um, let's see here. So. Uh, so I'm executive director of Walk a Million Trees Project. We're a relatively new nonprofit on the scene. We're, we're just having our second year anniversary this year, I mean this month. And um, we've been very warmly embraced by the community, which I'm very grateful for. And we have a three-part mission that you can see here. The easy way to think of it is plant, protect, and connect. And we feel all of those facets are very important. Sometimes when people hear our name, Walk a Million Trees Project, they, you know, without knowing the plant protect connect piece, they think, oh, you're planting a million trees in town. And I, and I always have to say, well, maybe someday we'll get to that, but it's really a three-part mission, um, which all builds together. So the planting piece, we're especially focusing on what we call some of the underfunded or ignored lands uh, within Whatcom County, um, whether it's in the city of Bellingham or, or outward. Um, via hands-on work parties and business partnerships. We um, tend to, so there's existing nonprofits that are doing great jobs at, for many years um, with planting and restoration. Nooksack Salmon Enhancement Association, for example, in the riparian areas, Wacom Land Trust, for instance, and their special gems that they acquire of property. But then there's a lot of land in between. You know, and the city uh, public works does restoration at certain sites too, but there's still a lot of other land in between that's either in semi-public use or it's public land or is private land. And we're focusing on those facets as well. It's kind of an extra piece in a complementary way to the others. So, so far in our first year, we've had projects mostly with city parks. I'm very thankful to be working with Nicole and her team um, on those projects. Uh, we've done uh, plantings and restorations at Juliana Park and Cordata Park and many others. Um, and we have more planned for the next planting season. We only plant during uh, the right time for tree seedling planting, plant, planting, which is you know mid to late fall and into you know uh, the end of winter uh, when the seeds when the seedlings are dormant. Um, and then the rest of the year we focus on uh, removing English ivy, which is a piece of the protect piece. Most people don't know in this community, it seems like, that English ivy will kill virtually every tree it climbs up on. And, you know, at first, for the first handful of years, you see ivy going up in the bark, and the usual reaction that I hear is like, oh, it looks so nice, more green and everything. But once that ivy gets up into the canopy in a short number of years, it will challenge the tree enough to kill it, uh, almost in every case. I have such a tree in my own yard, in fact, which you'll see a picture of in a moment. And so I, I will come back for in a moment about English ivy, but I just wanted to give you a quick overview of the types of projects we're involved with. 
Um, just to highlight one that we, were worked, we, we worked on just a few weeks ago, uh, not that far from here, over uh, by the campus, was uh, the region's first uh, Miyawaki mini forest, which is a special kind of planting project that's ideal for tight urban settings. But we're involved in a lot of other things too, not just with the city, but with the county, with, with uh, you know, public-oriented groups like Humane Society we're in discussions with, et cetera, et cetera. It, there's quite a range of things that we're involved with, um, either as planting seeds, so to speak, sorry for the analogy there, to, to get a project going or actually a project that's already happening. So why are we doing this? The obvious reason that's been the theme of today is you know, to address our climate and biodiversity crises. And as Nicole's video showed so well, tr it's all related to our health and, and the resilience of our communities as well. But underneath that, there's an important piece too, and that's to build hope and empowerment and engagement by, in people in our community. We find in our hands-on work parties, almost all the time we get people coming up at the end saying, wow, I just feel so good. I came out here today. I feel like I'm doing something with my own hands to help. And even if it's just a little drop in the bucket or something in the big global picture, it's still something you can do. And it makes an enormous... <clears throat> excuse me, enormous psychological benefit for people, which then ripples out to all sorts of other kinds of engagement in the community, we, we find. So, so I think that piece is as important as anything we're doing physically with trees or, or forest. And I'm gonna skip through this pretty quick because I think Nicole's video did a great job of overviewing all the benefits of um, trees. There are multiple benefits. As Nicole's video showed, it's actually an asset to the city, not a cost because it saves on you know, infrastructure and lots of other things. Um, and then I've got a slide here that especially uh, relates more to Seth's presentation. So think about those big um, carbon bubbles he showed. So here's a little comparison here, and this is just averages. There's a lot of variables that can flex these numbers around. But um, you, you, know, you can see what, uh, what we do in our use of cars or, or gas or, electric, or, or gas or, or heater, water heater or furnace. And then you can get a sense of what a Douglas fir, just in its first hundred years. Now that, you know, Douglas firs can live many, many hundreds of years. But just in the first hundred years, it's roughly comparable to any one of those items. So trees really do have an impact. And when you start to look in the bigger picture of the number of trees we have and the number of trees we can further either save or foster um, and nurture, it, it adds up to a significant piece that complements well the kinds of hardware and systems work that the city and Seth are doing. And again, this was in Nicole's video, but you can see that there are areas of tree loss in our community. Um, even though the overall average is staying at 40%, uh, there are significant areas, particularly in the inner city, where there's, where there's significant loss. And the tree equity thing was shown earlier. So now here's the English ivy, the, the silent killer villain that, <laughs> in a sense, that we fight with all the time. So we are, uh, part of our effort is mapping uh, English ivy throughout the city and in the county, um, all the major clusters of where it is, um, first starting with parks and greenways and public spaces um, out in the county as well. And um, that tree I mentioned in my yard, that's the one on the left there. So what happens is, is when the ivy gets up in the canopy, it outcompetes the tree's leaves, the tree weakens, and, and then typically in the next windstorm, the top snaps off, and then you have a dead snag. So then all, at that point, it stops capturing carbon, starts emitting carbon, you know, there's a whole triggering of, of impacts based on that. Um, so we have inventoried where the ivy is, we are, we, that help, helps us to assign where work parties go to be most effective. We tend to have 20 to 25 people at our ivy removal work parties. It's all ages, just like with parks work parties. You're all welcome to plug in and attend to that. It's easy work, it's not that usually that hard. Just working with hand clippers, there's no tree climbing or anything like that. We just remove from shoulder height on down and then clear about six feet around the base of the tree. Now, in most of the sites, that we work with, there's a lot of ground ivy. And so we're, while we're clearing six feet around the tree, 
It's not taking care of all the ground ivy. The way we envision this is a process. So this first wave right now that we're doing is to save the tree from being strangled. The clearing we do of six feet around the tree gives a buffer of a few years for that tree before that ivy will start to come back and want to climb up again on the bark. We imagine that we will come back and we've mapped all these locations so we know where it is. We come back in a year or two and do another wave of removal, mostly on the ground. And so over successive waves, we hope to literally, you know, remove, you know, 80% or so of the English ivy wherever it's threatening you know, or near trees, at least. We'll never totally remove it. There's just, it's just too um, widespread and invasive here. But if we can make a 80% kind of dent in it, that will be a, a major tree saver and a major you know, all the benefits that trees give, a, a community saver uh, for us. And, you know, again, uh, overlapping some of Nicole's and, and Seth's uh, presentation, there's flooding now, there's, there's um, heat dome effects. And then we have um, kind of our, where we're standing with uh, enhanced tree protections. And that's what the urban forestry management plan process is all about. And we're totally in support of that. And we're eager to see, you know, uh, the, the, the final steps of that process, and we will be involved and engaged with that. But we really do need to catch up in, in our local region compared to some of the other cities uh, in Washington that have had for many years uh, enhanced tree protections. And of course, you know, now that we're out of COVID and everything, more developments happening, that's going to accelerate tree canopy loss. Currently with the rules, there's not much incentive for developers to do otherwise. So we really got to get moving on that effort. And so again, we want to be part of that. And so you might wonder, uh, you know, because housing of course, is a, uh, and housing affordability is a big factor in our community as well. Um, it's not an either or kind of thing. Many cities around the world do what's called nature integrated development. That's something, that's the term we like to use as well. In fact, if you Google that, you'll find all sorts of things about cities around the world. But it is possible to balance housing needs and tree canopy growth. Um, and other cities are showing fine examples of that. The, the picture there is, happens to be Singapore. Yeah, you know, which has been doing that for a long, long time. But there's many other cities that have done it as well, um, not as ambitiously as, as Singapore, but there's, there's fine examples elsewhere. I think we can do that as well in our community and still you know, improve the housing affordability uh, uh, issue and also enhance our tree canopy. So when we talk to neighborhood groups and, neighbor and individuals, we talk about um, the possibility of becoming a neighborhood tree ambassador. That's our term for someone in a neighborhood who is really keeping their eyes open about the tree situation and helping them inform their neighbors about possibilities. And so I won't get into the details of any of these things here, but these are some examples of some of the things that those individuals can do. And it's, it's something that might take an hour or two or three per month. It's not a big commitment or anything, but if any of you are interested in being in that role, uh, please, uh, either through the website or after the talk today, get a hold of me. We would love to talk with you. We're building up kind of a core of these um, uh, uh, ambassadors who can help to clue us in as to how we can be most effective in neighborhoods, particularly in the neighborhoods that you saw the, um, on the tree equity map shown earlier that really need more tree canopy. And then looking at a wider focus beyond a neighborhood, there's lots of ways to plug in with us, uh, either volunteering at one of our work parties elsewhere in the community. Uh, you can learn more about native plants and trees. We can point you to resources about that. Of course, as, as Nicole pointed out, there'll be the whole process of giving feedback to the Urban Forestry Management Plan, which will be a very key document to, to move forward with tree canopy. Um, and then we have numerous other tree protection efforts we're involved with. We've been involved with in the Lake Whatcom watershed about um, uh, advocating for, uh, or in, for protection of the legacy forest in, in Lake Whatcom watershed with legacy forest being a term meaning the older forests that are almost old growth but not quite. Um, and we have other tree protection efforts like with the county, we just uh, helped uh, get a passage 7-0 uh, at the county council 
to revise tree retention rules for private property owners in the Lake Waka watershed and the Samish and Pannon watersheds. So there's various kind of like behind the scenes advocacy efforts were involved with this as well. So if, if that interests you, uh, feel free to get in touch. And then if you happen to own or manage or know someone who's running a business, we'd love to do business partnerships. We've got a number of them going on, um, whether it's like with A1 Design Build or Village Books or Pizzazza Pizza. Um, there's, we've got a whole bunch of them with more coming. And we've got a whole web page devoted to all sorts of different ways of which this shows just a few of them that businesses can work with us on it. Some of them aren't any cost to the business at all. And last but not least, I just want to say, uh, you know, if you've got an admin skill and you have a, you know, maybe you're retired or something and you have an interest in helping out an effort like ours, gosh, if you just got two or three or four hours a month and you have a skill from your earlier career in life that we might be able to use, please let us know. We'd love, we'd love to hear from you. And so in conclusion, so making an impact um, uh, about trees and forests um, and in our community, it's not about one person, it's not about me or any individual here. It's all about creating a movement together to further support our trees and forests. And that's kind of the underlying thing of what we're trying to do with Walk a Million Trees Project is to build a movement here to further our tree canopy um, so in the long-term future, which is so needed, uh, especially so in this climate challenged area that we have. So with that, I'll, I'll just say, um, if you do sign up for our newsletter, you get a really cool bonus that we developed uh, for uh, with several local arborists and, and uh, landscapers. And that, I think that's about it for now, except for questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, so much. Uh, can I ask you the, the, if, you know, any one of us in our own home area has lost a tree and it, it, they're, they're showing the impacts right now of these multiple dr drought years, at least I accredited it with that. It's just trees and shrubs dying. Uh, so if one wanted to replace some of those things, what guidance would you give in terms of choosing things that one, don't create invasive species of some kind, but secondly, are going to be able to survive as the climate is changing, as, as heat's occurring, et cetera. Do you have any tips on that? Yeah, thanks for the question. So uh, it, we're in kind of a transition moment right now. So nurseries, for example, local nurseries, and we've surveyed them all, still sell, for example, English ivy. Um, you know, and <laughs> I know it seems insane, but they do. And um, there's a lot of landscapers and, uh, out there and, and even arborists that we've encountered that aren't that aware of what's happening in terms of you know climate shifts and how that might you know shift some of the species that they might want to recommend or specify. So we're in that transition point right now. It's it's going to take more community education. We're we're going to be uh, for our part. We're going to be outreaching to um, all the nurseries to voluntarily convince to convince them to voluntarily not sell, for example, English ivy anymore. Um, it's not like they'd lose money. They just have to recommend something else besides English ivy. And um, so there's little shifts like that that can happen that I think will help to create a more appropriate palette of possibilities that the everyday person in our community can find out about as they go to a nursery or go elsewhere to you know, consider possible plantings in their yard. Yes. If you were going to replace a tree in your yard, what type of tree should you plant? Well, in general, we would recommend a native tree, of course, but um, uh, it, you know, it depends on soil conditions. It depends on the location of the tree. So there's no like just you know hard and fast rule that says okay, plant this or that. So. When in our pro planting projects, we generally plant a mix of about nine or ten different native species, um, and so you know, I, I, and they're all adapted to our climate um, here. So um, 
there, so there's a lot of considerations, but feel free if you to talk with me afterwards if you've got a specific situation you're wondering about. Yeah. Yeah, that's a similar question, but um, I had solar panels and I was telling you about options. Uh huh. Absolutely. In fact, in the Miyawaki Mini Forest project I mentioned earlier that we did over by Western, that's all about planting different layers of canopy. And so part of the mix in that project were some smaller trees. And sure, smaller trees won't capture as much carbon and that kind of thing, but still, it's tree cover and tree canopy. So yeah, absolutely, there are smaller native trees out there that would work very well in, in a lot of yards and in situations like that. Yeah. Okay, I have exactly the situation. So my question is, does the ivy root only in the ground or does it root on its way up the tree? So as the ivy's climbing up the bark, it's sucking a little bit of the nutrients from the bark, but it's mostly getting its nutrients from the strands that go into the ground in the roots. And ivy is partially spread by the strands, you know, growing, but it's mostly spread by birds because there's a certain time of year where the, the ivy has little berries and the birds eat it and then distribute it elsewhere. But the thing to note is, is that you'll never find English ivy like in the middle of a forest, pretty much. It's always along edges, like of roads, trails, households, things of that sort, where there's been you know, human disturbance of some way of the land, and that's where the ivy can take hold. Um, so when the ivy is climbing up the bark, it's slightly weakening the tree, but not enough to kill it. And then as it gets up into the canopy, that's when it takes over and, and can kill the tree. Also, can I just take the, what I need to say to take the roots off the, to the bottom, off the ground, and then would that kill it? So the step we use, I mentioned earlier about we remove from shoulder height on down. So we at shoulder height, but it can be lower if it's a yard tree. We use so, a shoulder height in the park system because it's easier to spot from a distance. But at any height, really, that's comfortable for you, you can create what's called a, what we call a circle of survival around the tree. So you just work your way around, usually with a hand pruner and some... Pardon me? Oh, sorry. Um, and uh, you work your way around, and once you've cut all the way around all the strands, then everything from up up above will eventually die off. Okay? So no tree climbing is required. Okay. Yeah. So we've got a lot of volunteer seedlings happening. Uh, it looks like that's one of your projects. What would you like done with the little, little volunteers? Yeah, so for those of you that have volunteer seedlings of the kinds of native trees we plant, and, you know, for example, out in Southern Valley, there's a gazillion of them in, in lots of, of yards and, and properties there. But um, if you have the interest, we um, have a little f um, section of our website that's all about plugging into us those seedlings. And so basically we ask that um, we, we have a suggested process of how, of how and when you transplant them. Um, and we have a list of the species we're interested in. And so, yeah, we absolutely would be happy to take those and we will use them in our projects. My question uh, relates to other cities of our size. You hinted, I think, uh, correct me, that Bellingham has a way to go to, to match other towns of this size. But judging from the biodiversity I see, deer, bobcats, even a mountain lion or two, uh, it suggests to me that uh, we have a lot of trees for them to live in and we're doing well. Yeah, I mean, compared to a lot of communities, you know, I grew up in San Diego. <laughs> it's like, what's a forest? You know, I didn't even know. And so it, it's, it's all relative. And, um, but we gotta be careful though, because as the urban forestry management plan showed, there's losses happening. And over time, that could accelerate without additional effort. And so whether it's through the park system or through you know, public works or through nonprofits like ours. So it's, it's kind of, it's easy anecdotally to kind of say, oh yeah, I've got lots of trees around and you know, it's amazing and cool. But it's, we're really at kind of a key threshold here. And 
you know, it, so we've got a global problem in terms of carbon capture, and there's numerous steps that have to happen, um, including the steps that, that Seth outlined on the hardware and system side. And trees are one piece of the equation. Ne neither systems only or trees only are going to help to really fully um, shift us in terms of this whole carbon dilemma we've got. But they're each important pieces of the pie. So I think there's more we can do um, as a community. Um, and again, you know, even though in the global picture, it's just a small little piece of the global picture of what we do in this region, Think about how the Cascadia forest, ranging from Alaska down through Oregon or, or Northern California, that, you know, people talk about the Amazon all the time as being the lung of the planet. Actually, the Cascadia forest region is a bigger lung than the Amazon. It just doesn't get the press. Okay, and there's not the kind of loss that happens that, that we're seeing in the Amazon. So we got to be, you know, digital, uh, diligent and, and resilient about our approach. And um, uh, and again, e you know, even forgetting the quantitative piece about the trees and, and carbon, it's, it's also about hope and empowerment, which I think is super important in our community now in these challenging times. Yeah, yeah. I certainly appreciate the work that you do. I'm curious how the Whatcom Million Trees Project is funded. Good question. So how Whatcom Million Trees Project is funded. So, so, so we're only two years old. Young nonprofits don't tend to get a lot of grants because usually grant agencies want to wait, you know, till you're three or four more years old. We have gotten a few smaller grants, like from uh, the Whatcom Community Foundation and others that we're, we're grateful for. But in terms of the really big, heavy-hitting grants, we, we haven't done that yet, um, but we will be stepping into that. Uh, most of our funding comes then from individual donors um, and then also our business partnerships. So that those are the two key pieces. Yeah. Might be a question for Nicole. Planning strip in front of my house with no trees in it. Can I just go buy some trees, or do I need to call you up and figure that out? The the answer to that is uh, if it's in the right of way or not. So if it's part of the right of way and not adjacent to your property. Between the strip, the sidewalk and the street, it probably is right of way. So we prefer that you get a permit. It's free from the permit center to plant a tree. You might get some advice on which tree to plant and you will be given a specification on the best way to plant that tree. And then it will be inspected as well. Okay, let's. we're going to take just a few more questions from the audience. Yes, for our panelists, any of them. Go ahead. Question for Seth. Seth, does the city of Bellingham have any targets? production and CO2 reduction based on past readings, present readings, and future readings, so we can get an idea if any of these uh, proposals are working. You're, well, it seems like that's a two-part question. Do we have goals, and then what's the impact? You know what, what the percentage of CO2 is now in the city of Bellingham versus the, the globe? Uh, so the question is about the the composition of CO2 in the air, or are you asking about the goals themselves for the city of Bellingham? Well, oh, first of all, like the composition of CO2 in the air in Bellingham versus the rest of the world, yeah. if you had any targets for reduction Got it. in Bellingham. Got it, yeah, so uh, answer the second one first. We do have uh, goals for the city, 40% uh, by 40% reduction from our 2000 levels by uh, 20, 30 and then by 2015, 85% reduction in carbon. And and given uh, about the CO2 in the air, we don't take direct measurements of, of CO2. We uh, calculate our contributions to the atmosphere from transportation, from the energy we use. We have a, a basically a large calculator that we put those inputs into. It tells us how much CO2 we're putting into the air, but we don't we don't uh, take measurements of of the CO2 directly. We rely on uh, 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 federal and, and global measurements of that um, just to tell us that, as you, you could guess, it's going up over time. Do you know what percentage of CO2 is in the Earth's atmosphere? Uh, parts per million, yeah. We're over 400 parts per million at this point of CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, I can't tell you that right now. It's less than half of 1%. Okay. I just want to know how Bellingham 
stacks up in terms of those readings. Is it more or less? Uh, yeah, we just use a global average of CO2 in the atmosphere for those, for that number. Am I, am I understanding your, your question correctly? Well, I'd like to know what the levels are now because I've been coming down here for 30 years. It seems to me the atmosphere of Bellingham is a lot better than it was 30 years ago. Mm. Yeah, we're we're looking at global averages of CO two. That's what we use to to create our our, our goals. Yeah, we don't take direct air pollution measures. is different than the atmosphere. So air pollution is yeah yeah. Well, listen, I'd I'd really like to thank and ask you to join me in thanking our panelists for a very good presentation. Western, I will have to comment, Western's environmental, you know, College of Environmental Studies really obviously is adding a whole bunch to this community in terms of our ability to understand environmental issues and to deal with them in constructive ways. So uh, I appreciate the fact that we've got some members of our panel, two thirds of it actually, that directly got their education there. And Michael, who's brought his from Cal Poly up here to help us out. So we've got a, a well-educated group here and everything. Jane, I'm going to turn things over to you so that you can make any concluding comments you wish. Thank you, Tim. And I would also like to thank our panelists and Tim for today's program. Uh, I am Jane Bright, and I am the new uh, program chair for the Bellingham City Club. And as you all know, this is our first in-person meeting in, what, three years or plus, however long it's been. So we are looking for feedback from you on how this went, uh, the program, programs like you'd like to see in the future, the venue suggestions, please. The, you know, this is uh, your group, uh, so we'd like to hear from you. We have some really interesting programs coming up over the next several months. Uh, the program committee has been very busy. And we have, of course, some interesting elections coming up and post-primary, we will be holding candidate forums. We have a speaker who will be discussing uh, toxics, uh, toxic in politics. Uh, we'll be looking at the Supreme Court, uh, the Innovation Corridor, as you know, from, I think, Portland to Vancouver, BC. We're looking at what we can do collectively in that whole community. And next month, um, I've got two numbers for you to think about, 490 and 75%. 490 is the number of proposed legislations across the US and various states that are considered anti-LGBTQ by the American Civil Liberties Association and 75% is the number of high schoolers who identify as heterosexual. Think about the other 25%. So next month, we're going to dive into under, you know, increasing our understanding. Uh, we're a pretty interesting species. When you think about it, we're much more complex than certainly I realized when we were growing up, uh, and understand the LGBTQ community better, and also how to become allies and uh, kind of what's going on, particularly um, as, as you, if you've been following any of this, the, um, I don't know how else to put it, but the uh, sort of the isolation and vilification of children for who they are. So this is a, uh, uh, in, a very important topic uh, for us today in, in knowing our, our own community. So please join us next June right back here at the Bellingham Yacht Club. And uh, again, give us your feedback. And thank you all for coming. And thank you especially to our panel. Thank you.